Hey everybody, it's your boy, Bishop Cortez Vaughn, and I am the senior pastor here at Evangelistic Center Church. A few months ago, I started digging through some archives, and I found a plethora of VHS tapes. Yes, you heard me correctly, VHS tapes. If you have watched this series thus far, you have already enjoyed our throwback footage. This video is a special one for me. Join me as we travel back to March 1st, 2002, where the late Bishop Carlton Pearson was the guest as we celebrated our founder, my grandfather, Superintendent Willie C. Vaughn, affectionately known as Dad Vaughn. Take a look at this. Great is thy faithfulness. Ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Great! 
was uh, thy faithfulness. Even when I was unfaithful, Jesus, great is thy faithfulness. I'm so unfaithful, Lord. Great is thy faithfulness. He has been faithful to me. Great is thy Stand on your feet, everyone. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. Walk with me, Jesus. Please walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Please walk with me. While I'm on this Jesus journey, and I want you every day of my life to walk with me. friend, Jesus, hey, will you be my friend? Be my friend, Lord, will you be my friend? Well, while I'm on this teacher's journey, yes, and I want Jesus every day of my life, I need him to be my friend. Talking to Jesus, be my friend, Jesus. Hold my hand, walk with me, please, Jesus. Yes, come on, walk with me, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. I gotta have some help down here. Come on, Jesus. I need him to walk with me. Come on, Jesus. Please walk with me. Be my friend, Jesus. I gotta have some help down here. You said you never leave me. You never forsake me. Jesus! Jesus! I need you in my home, in my marriage, with my children, in my ministry. Jesus! Please, 
Jesus. How many of you need him to walk with you? Come on, Lord. Hey, let me hear you sing. Yeah. So they get in Come on, clap them hands and praise the name of the Lord, everybody. Give him glory. Turn to somebody and say, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Say, I love him with all my heart. And I don't know about you, but I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. Come on, tell somebody, I don't know what you're going through. And I don't know what you've been through, but I'm here to tell you by faith that the worst for you is over. Come on, say it by faith. The worst for you is over. Say it again. The worst for you is over. And the best is yet to come. Yeah, 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 yeah. How many of you know it's not what you're going through, it's what you're going to? The devil ain't upset with where you are or where you've been, but he's scared to death of where you're going. Tell somebody, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. I'm, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. Hey, I'm on my way. My, 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 high five about three folks and say, listen, you better watch me closely because I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> Glory. Hey, hey, hey. Oh, Lord. Oh. God is a good God. Hey, hey. I feel some Holy Ghost up in here tonight. Oh, Lord. Somebody say yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Say it again, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. Father, we thank you for your mighty presence among your people, for the sweet anointing of the Holy Ghost not only breaking but destroying yokes of bondage you have rebuked the devourer for our sake my soul doth magnify you thank you for your repeated mercies that are new every morning and continually for the grace that's so amazing thank you for these dear saints your people who come out on this cold stormy night to celebrate your servant the man of God, our dad, who lending their hearts and their voices and their hands to say thank you for the apostle of God. Thank you for Jesus, whose blood covers our souls and our sin. Thank you for the cleansing, for the deliverance, for the anointing, for forgiveness. Thank you for new starts. Thank you for miracles happening in our families right now, in our homes that we left tonight for major breakthroughs. He, every mockery of the devil, every manipulative thing he has done to upset your people, we rebuke it now in Jesus' name and cast the devil out of the minds of all. Loose him here tonight. Loose our families. Every marriage, every financial situation, every mind game the devil plays, we come against it right now by the power of God. Take your hands off. Take your hands off. In Jesus' name.
Thank you that you've gone ahead of us to prepare the way and that all things work together for good to those of us who love you and are called according to your purpose. Let the blessing of the Lord make us rich tonight, adding no sorrow to it. In Jesus' name, everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Come on, say it again, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Amen. 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 Bless you. Thank you. Be seated. God is a good God. This might be for somebody in here tonight. There is no pain. Jesus can feel. No hurt. He cannot. Masters, holy and perfect will. So, no matter what you're going through, remember Jesus, the Lord God is only using you. And the battle, huh, it ain't yours. Somebody say hallelujah. It's the Lord. There is no sadness Jesus can't feel. And oh, 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 there's no sorrow that he cannot heal for. That all things work according to the master's whole and perfect will. Oh Lord, so no matter what you're going through, Jesus, the Lord God has his hand on you. Yes, it does. And the battle. It is not yours. It's the Lord's. Hey, it's the Lord's. How many of you know that? It's, it's the Lord's. So hold your head up high. Don't you even cry. Yeah. It's the Lord. Hey, it's the Lord. I'm telling you, it's the Lord. So no matter what you're going through, remember Jesus, the Lord is only you. You're going through. Jesus, the Lord God has his hand on you. And no matter what you're going through, Jesus is only using you. And the battle is not yours. It ain't yours. Say it. the cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It ain't yours. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord. Yes, it is. Come on, tell him, yeah. How many of you got something you need to throw at the altar tonight? 
Think about your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your brother, sister, somebody somewhere. The devil's trying to mock somebody in here tonight. You've been holding on and praying and believing God. And the devil's trying to make a mockery of your faith because the doctor just told you you have a tumor or a growth or you have a wayward son or daughter and you've been doing all this praying and all this fasting and now the enemy is telling you it's not working. But just say the battle is the Lord's. Come on, look at somebody and say the battle is the Lord's. Say it ain't mine this time. I'm giving it to Jesus. It's going to be all right. I'm not worried about a thing. God has it all together. The best for me is yet to come. It ain't mine. It ain't yours. It ain't yours. It ain't yours. It ain't yours. The battle, it's not yours. It's the Lord. Come on, clap those hands and praise him once again, everybody. Hallelujah. Thank you. I was thinking or not, I've been in church all my life. And we used to have a Friday night service in San Diego. Every Friday night, we went to church, shouted and danced and ran and hollered and testified. <laughs> And I'm gonna be, but I've been 40 for going on nine years. <laughs> Next month, be 49 years old, and in the church, this is just church. That's all, all I've done. I love church. I love the saints. I, even when I was little, as my little son over there, I liked the way the church smelled. I liked the way the pews looked. I, I knew the saints. Knew how they. About when they was going to quick it. <laughs> Knew it with the testimony. I could say it for him almost. But I loved it. I've always loved it. And here we I am after all these years. Couldn't hardly wait to get here. I was tired. Still couldn't hardly wait to get here and to see you tonight and feel you. Feel the anointing. In the, in the choir. I, came in the, I think the choir was singing. And when I came in downstairs, I could feel it way down there. These... My God, I, I can't believe this, the singing and these sons and that, that, that Vaughn family. I would have been waving like Dad. I, I just, I'm almost envious. He gets, he gets to look at almost four generations of his own seed. Uh, that, that's just, uh, you couldn't ask for more. Nothing would honor you more than to know that you lived. And I know Dad's story. I've sat for hours and listened to him. I'd laugh and cry and laugh and cry and quicken and cry and laugh and fascinated at the stories of how he raised his family and all the work he did and feeding them and then come to work, home from work, get a little mouthful of something and might have been on a fast and go straight into a revival. And uh, all his children love God and his grandchildren love God. And he gets to live and see this and see what his son is doing and his sons are doing and all this property and all these buildings and all the glory and all these churches overseas and all the things he lived and dreamed about and talked about and believed for and watched for that he gets to see it with his own eyes. He could be up in heaven looking down, but the Lord let him see it here. Tremendous. Thank God that Dad Vaughn is alive and well on the earth today. 10,000 teachers, but not many fathers. Not many fathers. Full of wisdom, full of the Spirit of God. Always has that little twinkle in his eyes. A little sweet smile. He's just precious. He's just precious, and isn't it wonderful that you don't wait till he dies to celebrate him and honor him? I, I love this man in ways I haven't been able to express, and I adore him and respect him and honor him, and God brought him into my life almost 20 years ago. God gave him prophetic utterances, and God gave him the wise counsel to share with me 
in the earlier days of my ministry, when I just started my full-time ministry, having left the OR, uh, OR Roberts Association, came to Kansas City. We were at Quindaro, Church of God in Christ. When Dad came in, I think Jack brought him in. They sat back there, and he never looked up, just with his eyes closed, head like that, the whole time. I got nervous. <laughs> I said, he looked like God sitting out there. <laughs> What's, what's that old man doing in this service? Listen to this young preacher. He, and then he came back. I was doing the day sessions. I didn't get to meet him. They, they took him out the first day. And I kept saying, who is that older man that came in here? I, I wanted to kiss him and run at the same time. You know, some of them old holiness folks, you look like they can look right through you with the eyes closed. <laughs> I went to repenting and stuff when he came in. <laughs> I said, Lord, I know I did some stuff wrong, but he, and he probably know it too. Lord, help. <laughs> help me, Lord. And uh, what a great honor. I talked with, I was talking with Earl Roberts the other night. He's 84, and, and Bishop Quander Williams, Will, Wilson was with us, yes, last night in Toledo, Ohio, just from open heart, from, um, just got a pace setter put in his, a pacemaker uh, put in his chest, and there he was in the meeting. And um, I thought, we don't have very many of them anymore. And the ones we do have, we should honor and listen to. And I've been missing, I call, dad talks for days on the phone, you can't hardly get off, but I, I miss it. I need, I've been empty without hearing his voice. I need to hear him more. I need to hear all I can. Hear his story. Some of them I didn't heard before, but they sound good every time. <laughs> look at the gospel, so many of the stories were repeated. Because God wants you to hear it more than once. And every time I hear it, I get something I didn't get before. Huh? That's the one phone number I know I can call at any hour. And it's the only one I have called at all hours of the night. <laughs> Sometimes I just want him to catch the devil out of me for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I love you. It's a, such an honor to be here tonight. I just, I so I appreciate, I saw your daughter just rub your head and kiss you a minute ago. You, I know it. I just, I'm so thankful that God has given all his children such love for him and, and such respect for him. They honor this man. They, his sons, all his sons and daughters honor him. And it's not something he has to demand. They stand up when he comes in the room and he, 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 he still rules, you know. He's, he's the, as he would say, he's the king. <laughs> he's the king. We, we are princes, and, but this man is left here to watch a generation transition. He came through the millennium and the decade and the century to watch us, didn't he, Jack? To watch us go where we're going. And, and I thought about him uh, the other night. I was preaching in Memphis at the convocation on the very night that, that Oral Roberts and I went uh, 27 years ago. Uh, but I wasn't allowed to speak that night. Oral and I went down on a private jet from the university at Bishop Patterson's invitation, whom I had introduced to Oral Roberts the preceding January. And I wanted the two men to meet. They had never met. So I introduced them in 1972. And uh, so then Bishop Pat J. O. Patterson invited Oral Roberts to come and speak on the last night of the convocation, the Sunday night meeting. So I went, I told this there, and I'll tell it here because Dad's been telling me about the church and stroking my roots. He strokes my roots. He always goes back to my roots and work, does a lot of root work when I'm with him. And we need that because that's your foundation. But I had, um, I had gone with Oral and, and uh, he wanted me to come with him to the platform. It was just Oral Roberts, me, and two security guards. And I was about 19 years old. I would have been 20 that following March. And I went with him, and he, he said, come on to the platform with me. I said, no. Um, they didn't ask me to come, and I, you just, you go on. I had gone in the, in the room where the general board meets, the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Almost took my shoes off when I went in there. They were in there praying before the meeting, and, and so Oral kept trying to get me to go in. I said, don't worry about it. I'll explain it later. I can't come up there now. 
He said, come on, son. I said, no, you don't understand our church. <laughs> you don't go up on that platform without an invitation or they'll be casting you out like you a demon. And I said, I, I ain't going up there. <laughs> and I said, I'll see you after service. I, I told him where I'd meet him. And I walked among the saints, all the saints from San Diego was there. Mother Sherman that I tell the story about, she was sitting out there, Mother Garner, all them saints. I was going through there, hugging them and kissing them. They said, oh, baby, baby, let me give you something. They was giving me money. <laughs> so I raised me a good official offering out in it. <laughs> baby, here's $20, here's $5. Here. I just had a good old official district meeting offering. <laughs> And uh, so when, I, when we finished and left, but he did say, he told them five minutes after he was up that I was there, a young son of the, un of the uh, church, one of our young Crompers, where are you, Crompers? Stand up and wave. And I did and waved. I was standing right next to Mother Sherman. I just kissed her and got my offering. <laughs> and I waved and I put my hands down. The saints applauded a little bit. And I said, Lord, why didn't you let me just give a testimony? This is my church. These are my people. Why? Just let me just testify, because I never had been any of the meetings, even when I was a little kid, where they didn't have me to testify. Where's that little Pearson boy? Come, bring him, Bishop Cross. Where's, where's that Carlton Pearson? Come, come, young man, say something for the Lord. Come on up there and say something for Jesus. And so I would always testify, but nobody, not that night, not in Memphis. And so I said, Lord, I, I wish, I just wanted to just give a little testimony. And the Lord said, it's not time for you to speak to this people. He didn't say these, he said this people. He said, but the day, the time will come, and when it does, you will have something to say. That was 28 years ago. And I was speaking on the very Sunday night that Oral had spoken 28 years earlier. And my own brethren, I went there, and there was such a sweet fragrance of God. Now, that was more for me than it was for anybody else, for God proving something to me about seeing generations succeed. I turned behind me, and all of those bishops were sons of bishops. All, the, all those men that were on that platform, when I went there, none, not a one of them was still there. Bishop Washington, Bishop Ford, all those guys were gone. I saw those sons. And we are rep right now in this generation, we're seeing sons come into a, a maturity and take certain responsibilities, but with a different dimension. It will be a little easier for us than it was for them. We won't, my son's with me tonight sitting over there, and, and we flew in when I, whenever I charter, I take my son with me if I can. And I always, he's seven years old. He's a very loving, affectionate son. And my, but my boy goes to private schools. He's been to Disneyland every year. And I didn't go the first time until I was 14 years old. And that's because my eighth grade teacher saw me as a little low-income kid, underprivileged, and gave me. <laughs> and took me there. And uh, I, I, my kids uh, have, have experienced things. So has Jack's sons and have experienced things that we didn't experience ourselves. I was proud when my mother came home from cleaning some other lady's house with a little pair of britches that she found and half a loaf of bread and a couple of bananas and some oranges left over. And anybody know what I'm talking about? Some old tennis shoes and something. Sometimes they take that stuff home and, and keep it till Christmas or wrap it up. And we were so glad to get them little jeans and shoes. And we didn't care how brand new they were. They was new to us because we didn't have them. Now the houses some of y'all live in today, the only time you ever went in a house like that was to clean it, and you know it, with your mother or grandmother or godmother or something. Look what the Lord, look at somebody and say, the Lord has brought me from a long way. Come on, tell them, you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. My God, and you can't tell it like I can. Ah, what the Lord has done for me. He brought me from a long way. Hey, God. Just another day that the Lord has kept me. Yeah. So I'm excited to be alive today. I'm excited for what God is doing. Now, I don't know where that sister, is it Rucker? Is your name Rucker too? Just like your dad? I don't know where you've been, girl. From me, I mean, I know everybody else in the world know you, but you dangerous. This is, it is not even. 
it, it ain't even fair for folks to sing like that. <laughs> it just ain't fair. I know it's right, but it don't seem fair. You, it's dangerous. You ought to have to have a license to sing like that. It, that's, 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 that, that song's... And, and I don't know if it's Jack Jr., but whatever those Vaughn boys have, that, 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 that's not just, those are not just instruments, those are weapons. You was killing devils with that song. Huh? You, you get free. There's something that happens in that. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, turn to somebody and say one more time, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. I said, I just love him with all my heart. Oh, Lord. Pastor David Smith over at the organ travels with us all over. and Wonderful man of God. Elder Jesse Williams, one of our st pastoral staff, and I'm, I'm about to put him on the pastoral staff at the church, but he's the executive director for the Azusa Fellowship Office and has done wonders there, just does a great job with our fellowship of churches around the world, and, and uh, he has a pastoral spirit, as Pastor David does, and we just love the church and love God's people. To our brother from all the way from, well, I didn't realize you, Jack, you didn't tell me it was Benin City. That's, that's where the Idahosas live. I met the king and, and the chief of, in, of that tribe in Benin. I didn't realize you were uh, Pastor told me he'd been to Africa, and he said Nigeria, but I didn't realize it was Benin City. Do you know that one out of four black people on this planet are Nigerians? There's something happening in that country. Uh, there's a curse that is on that continent that we're breaking. The UN can't break it. The UN can't do what we can do. It's going to have to be Holy Ghost filled African Americans and others with the power of God to go back to the homeland, to the motherland. Are you hearing me? Something is opening up over there in the most unusual way. In the most unusual way and that, that God is using, actually using Africans. I'm not actually an African American, I'm an American African. There are African Africans, there are European Africans, there are American Africans. An African African is an African born in Africa that lived in Africa or might live here. He'd be an African American if he living in Houston because he was born in Africa. We we're American Africans. We came over here and as painful as it was, God had a reason for sending us here. He said, and ships shall go out from me to frighten Cush out of her complacency. There had never been a Colin Powell or an Oprah Winfrey or Bill Cosby or Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. If somebody hadn't have weathered the storm across the sea, 1609 arrived in Virginia. Nobody knew that only for almost 400 years later out of West Virginia would come a T.D. Jakes. <laughs> This is a powerful day to be alive. God's doing something extraordinary. And I'm excited to see what I'm seeing, what my eyes are seeing. And I'm, I'm excited about what our future holds. Turn to somebody and say, you haven't seen anything yet. Tell them you're one decision away from the greatest miracle you could ever imagine. Just one decision away, one choice away. You might make that choice tonight. Glory. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 15 for a few minutes. I, I won't keep you real long tonight. I've just enjoyed the Lord so much already. I am in transition. I, I just ran for mayor of Tulsa. And um, the Lord said to do it. He didn't tell me to when, it, when he told me to run. I would have been a great mayor. I'm, I'm great. <laughs> and I had 30 days to get 13% of the vote. I actually had way more than that, but in, the, in Tulsa primaries, you have to vote down party lines. And I was running on the Republican ticket and many people changed parties, but others didn't know. They never voted in a, Repu in a, in a primary election. They wait to the general and it was snowing. So they came to the polls and my name wasn't even on the ballot because you have to vote down party line. But God gave us a, a seat at the table, a voice, 
and we ran a clean, clever, classy campaign. The governor of the state called and said, man, I voted for you, my wife voted for you, our friends voted for you, and we know you'd make the best mayor, and please, he said, you, don't, you have no idea the deep inroads you made into this culture. You, you got out of the box, you did something out of the, uh, out of the ordinary, and you shook the city. And they, now, the, now the congressmen and senators, they were calling and come to the White House calls. and said, we're watching this campaign. You're shaking some things up. They saw us as only a preacher, but then they saw me as a reacher, and they saw me take command of the issues. And I said, Jesus ran a three-and-a-half-year campaign. And the last week of the campaign, the crowd came out and voted for Bar Barabbas. Remember that? They didn't even know who he was. With all those miracles, they still voted against Jesus and killed him. But that doesn't mean he wasn't Jesus. He went to Calvary. It was all in line. So I said that, and I'm talking a little bit about getting out of the box tonight. And so let's look at this. After, the, after this, verse 15, uh, chapter 15, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. After this, the word of the Lord, the word there is debar for word, the matter in Hebrew, or cause, uh, an affair, a purpose. The word of the Lord came to Abram. His name is not Abraham yet. It's Abram in a vision. Avram or Avrahim or Avrahim. Ab is the word daddy or father. Abba, father. Abram, the word of the Lord came to Abram in visuals, in vision. God spoke to Abraham in words that became images. Now follow me, okay? The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And the first thing God said was, don't be afraid or don't be frightened, don't be alarmed. When you get a vision from God, if it's really from God, initially it will scare you. Because it is so big, it, it seems so impossible. It's something that you could not possibly do on your own. He'll show you things that almost make you feel stupid to tell somebody. You, you feel like you're bragging by even saying it. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in visuals, in perceptions, in his imagination. Do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. Exceeding great reward. If you see that in Hebrew, it means you're rapidly increasing money. That's what the Hebrew would, would actually translate in those words. But Abram, Avram, said, O oh Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? When do you hear a man complain about not having kids? His name was Avram, Abba, father. And he has no children. So he's experiencing an identity crisis. My name is the Father is on high, or the exalted Father. And I don't have any children. It's like being called Christian, which means anointed ones, and have no anointing. <laughs> it's being called anointed, and your faith ain't working. I'm finding out that all over the world now, Christians are experiencing some kind of an identity crisis. You believe certain things and you don't see it happening. You know certain things and yet it's not really realized in your life. I believe in a God who does miracles, but it's been a long time since you saw one. You believe in a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the other one on the cattle and you can't pay your rent. You're struggling in areas. You're believing God for your children. The enemy is dangling things in front of you, mocking you today because of something you know in your innermost being is a possibility, but it probable, probably you think won't happen. So Abram's going through this same thing. My name is Father, and I have no children. And so you say, Father, what can you do for me since I am unproductive? Maybe you have a talent similar but you don't have a recording contract. Maybe you have gifts and, and, and you, you've written songs and poets, poems and you, you've designed things and, and nobody really recognizes what's in you yet. That don't happen overnight. 
You fasted and prayed and you've waited and watched and you, you feel like God has spoken something inside of you, but you haven't realized it yet. Not a one of you ministers down here haven't sat around and, and, and you know you're anointed. You know God gave you a word and ain't nobody listening to you, seem like. Came off a three day, seven day, 14 day, 21 day, 40 day fast. And 40 people came. And you know God spoke to you. And we wrestle with things inside of us. Like, I know God is able. I know he can. I know he's supposed to. But he hasn't yet. And I, I don't know why every time I get close to my breakthrough, the devil steps in with something and, and stops me right there. And I end up going back. And, and many folks are restless today because they do have vision. But they haven't realized it. And I want to tell you tonight... You're just about to step in to the realization of things you've almost forgotten God told you were going to happen in your life. If you want to see a living example of it, here it is. If we're going to honor the bishop tonight, this is this man, and I say bishop because he's the overseer of this work. Episcope. Paul said, I press toward the mark. The word is scopos, where we get the English word scope. I press toward, and the word press is dioko in Greek, which means to pursue and execute or persecute. I'm, I'm chasing after this vision. I see something. Nobody else sees it but me, but it's there. I'm a spiritual paranoid schizophrenic. I see something that nobody else sees. I hear something that nobody else hears. I can't get folks to see what I see and hear what I hear, but they wonder why I'm looking over there. I'm seeing something you ain't looking at. Well, I'm looking up because I see something that nobody sees but me. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've been there. I heard it. My God, nobody heard it but me, but I heard it. And I can't deny that I heard it. And they say, you crazy. Man, who you think you are? You stupid. You know. But I heard God. Look at somebody and say, I heard him. You can't make me doubt him. I know too much about him. He's real. Jesus is real. I know that he's real. <laughs> Abram said, Lord, what can you give me? I, since I am unproductive, what can you give me or make me or what can what appointment what can you ascribe to me or assign to me since i remain childless i'm unproductive i don't have no children and the one who will inherit my estate my legacy is eliezer eliezer of damascus and my right hand man I, and abram said you you've given me no children god so serve it in my household, be my heir. You've given me no children, Lord. I want kids. I want a building. I want to realize a dream. I want a business. I want to realize a home, a, a family. A, I want my degree. I want my contract to record. I want, I want something. I, I got an itch that can't nothing scratch but... Yes. I, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I, I get mad. I get tired. Folks make me sick. <laughs> they get on my nerve. Some folks, you want to kill them and tell God you found them dead. You know what I'm saying. You, you. They rubs me the wrong way. They worry me. They don't have vision. They... They suck the energy out of me. They, they drive me out. They beat on me. I don't. You ever been on the phone talking to somebody when you hung up the phone? It seemed like you, you, you was weak. You was empty and hollow, and you, and you was talking to your mother or your brother or your best friend or your, your husband or your wife or them cheering. <laughs> Let me tell you what unequally, being unequally yoked is. It's not just hanging out with folks that don't believe in Jesus. Being unequally yoked is hanging out with folks who don't believe in your potential.
You better find somebody who can identify with where you're going and who will connect with you in the spirit and help you get where you're going. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Abram said, Lord, I, I, what I got is, is not, didn't come from my loins. I, I'm, I'm struggling. I need productivity. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man ain't going to be your heir. It ain't going to happen the way it looks. But a son coming from your own body, your own bowels, your own soul, your own self will be your heir. And here's the key part, verse 5. He took him outside. He got outside the box. He broke outside the tent. He had to leave the tent. Because as long as you stay in that tent, you'll never be able to see above the ceiling. You've got to go out and take a risk and do something that don't make no sense at all. You got to break traditions. The word tradition comes from the word trade. Some things that have been traded down over the years and centuries that don't work anymore. Trade winds are winds that blow continually the same direction toward the equator. That's why we call them trade winds. God is saying, get out of your comfort zone. Do something you've never done before and expect something you've never expected before. Come on, you better hear me. Some of y'all, that means shift some of the folks you're hanging out with. Because some folks do not want to go into the land of promise. They, they used to lingering in the wilderness. They used to the manna from heaven. They used to the cloud by day and fire by night. And they are not used to the walls of Jericho tumbling down. And you got to let them go. You better hear me. It's not going to work any longer. Turn to somebody and say, God is doing a new thing. Let me tell you why you're uncomfortable. You're shifting. You, 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 you're restless. You, 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 some folks say, well, why don't you just come? I can't. I got, something's happening inside of me. Preachers, any, any of you that are in turn with God, you're just, yeah, what, what is it? I, I went to church, I ate, I did what I do, but I, I don't feel comfortable with this. What is happening? Something's coming down the pike. I got to go somewhere. Remember, God will always show you the land of promise while you're still living in Egypt. He'll always show you the land flowing with milk and honey while you're eating onions and garlic. He'll always show you the land of prosperity while you're still living in poverty. And he never takes you directly from Egypt to Canaan. He always sends you through the wilderness. You have to go through the wilderness. He sends you through the wilderness because he does not want Egypt in Canaan. He sends you through the wilderness to wash Egypt out of your mind. The Bible said he sent them through the wilderness to test their hearts, to see what's in there. He sends you through that dry place, but he feeds you he spoon feeds you, hand feeds you with manna from heaven. But then there comes a time when the manna stops falling and you can't see a cloud by day and fire by night. You got to yeah. The word of the Lord came to him in a vision. Now, let me tell you something. Light travels 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second light a light year is the distance that light can travel in one year at that speed something like 17 trillion miles sound on the other hand travels only 1100 feet it sometimes it take years to get to you but when he shows you something you Instantly, the vision is there. Sound is the, is the Greek word, akos. 
where we get the English word echo. Faith doesn't come by seeing. Faith comes by hearing. So I don't care what you see. If you ain't heard from God, you can't believe for it. The word hear is the Greek word akulio, where we get the English word acoustics. It bounces off. That's what you're hearing right now. It's bouncing off the walls. It's called repetition or resonation, resounding. Faith is that which repeats itself over and over in your spirit. It's bouncing off the walls of your life. From the ceiling of your soul to the feet of your faith, it's bouncing. You hear it when you can't see nothing. You hear it when you sleep. You hear it when you awake. You hear it in the shower. You hear it washing the car. You hear it in the midst of an argument. You hear it when everybody else is saying something totally different. You keep hearing God say something in your spirit and you can't get away from it. Faith cometh by hearing. When I say echo, let me tell you something. That's why I say we're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences. We are spirits having an earthly encounter. You have a mind, you have a body, but you are a spirit. And before God ever gave you a body or a mind, he whispered something in your spirit. And as you go through life, that thing is echoing. An echo is a sound out of the past. And it comes down over the centuries to you. And when it hits you, it's like, oh, that's always been there. It's been in your spirit, but your ears just caught it. <laughs> and once he said it, then here comes the vision. That's why many of you pastors can stand and give a word and tell the folks what the Lord showed you. And they just look like they nod, but they ain't heard and seen nothing. <laughs> you get so frustrated. That's why sometimes pastors or leaders seem a little bit aloof. They can't hang out with everybody all the time, and you know, they, they get permission to go among you and laugh, and then there's the, then you got to get away because you start hearing something. You slip into that quiet place. That's what happened to Moses. He was up on the mountain in the presence of God. Been up there about a month and 10 days. I heard Dad Vaughn said it, and it left the church in the hands of the assistant pastor. He couldn't keep it a month and a half. Aaron. <laughs> the pastor was up on the mountain in the presence of God, and the people got restless. You have to spoon feed some of them, you know. They said, where, this Moses, that he, 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 we don't know what's going to happen to him. He's up in that mountain, and we don't know when he's coming down. Let's have our own district meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and they raise an offering. The folks start giving gold and created their own thing to worship. And Moses was up there in the presence of the Lord and having a great time. And God said, Moses, get thee down. And Moses said, get down. What you mean? Get that. <laughs> no, I mean get down the mountain. Get down the mountain. We ain't been up here but a few minutes. You've been up here 40 days. You ever got on your knees to pray and three, four hours later, maybe six hours later, a few days later, you, you got off, off your knees, you... You thought you're going to give a short prayer and you went into that other realm. Some of you don't even know what that is. You go into that other place. You, you've gone three or four days and had not had a thing to eat and didn't even know you hadn't eaten. God was dealing with you. Moses was in the presence of God. And God said, get down the mountain. I didn't even know I was up here this long because in his presence there's fullness of joy. There's completion at his right hand. <laughs> oh, Lord. When you get into that presence, you want to stay up there. And that's why sometimes we, you remember the old days when we had church all night long? Mm -hmm. The old saints used to say, stop now. 
It's praying time. I said, stop now. It's praying time. Stop now. It's praying time. The sun is almost down. Jesus. The old prayer means. Remember that? Come in the room, Lord. Come in the room. Come on, Jesus. Somebody say, come on, Jesus. Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. That's before you had a whirlpool to go home to. That's before I had my jacuzzi. That's before all these good things God bless us. We'd linger in this house all night long. Because God was there. Somebody see you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. God said, Moses, get down the mountain. Why do you want me to get down the mountain, sir? He said, the people are sinning. And Moses thinking, oh, man, that's why I came up this mountain to try to get, <laughs> try to get away from some of them peoples. You know, our dad said, the peoples. I don't want him to say it no other way, the peoples. Where is you? The flesh. How do I get out of this rut? Come outside the tent. Make the break. Step out. And he said, God said, look at the heavens and count the stars. Now, you don't see stars in the daytime. So at the darkest time of your life, your greatest revelations can come. See, they're there day and night, but you can't see them until it's dark. When you're going through the darkest, lowest, most pitiful, painful time, God says, step outside, I'm going to show you something. You can't see them stars in the daytime, so he waits till you're going through a nighttime. Weeping endures for the night. And God will speak to you when you're weeping. Speak to you when you're hurting. Speak to you when you can't see no other way out. And he'll show you things that you didn't know were there. Because as long as the light is shining, you don't see the stars. When everything is bright, you don't know what's going on. It's when it's dark that you say, my God, I didn't know they were there. And you know what they tell us? Some of the stars we see now possibly burned out actually millions of years ago. But the light just now reached this universe. Scientifically. Finally, you're seeing a light. The actual planet burned out. But you see, light can't stop. I don't care how dark it is. You can light one candle and darkness backs away. Darkness cannot overcome light. You can go in a pitch black room. Now, this room has got the lights on. I don't care how much darkness comes in here. It can't overcome the light as long as the light is shining. Uh, turn to somebody and say, keep the light burning. Walk in the light, beautiful light. Come where the dew drops of mercy shine bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Come on, sing to me. Come on. And let us walk in. Beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops come where. A mercy shine bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of. Now remember this. You will always move toward the dominant images you allow to invade or pervade your mind. I'm almost finished. Emotion is the power that attracts. Emotion is energy in motion. What you fear most, you will ultimately experience. You will experience what you fear. But by the same token, what you faith most, you will experience. Images are like magnets. 
If you see yourself with a tumor and a growth and a divorce and sickness and poverty and death, perception is the ultimate reality, not necessarily the ultimate truth. How you perceive is your reality. Are you hearing me? So you be careful what you allow to dominate your, your thinking. In order to change your thinking, you got to shift where you are, come outside and see something you didn't know was there. Now the stars were there anyway, but he never crossed his mind to try to count them as they relate to his potential. Come outside. Make the change. Make the shift. Go to the next level. Things that worked 20 years ago may not work today. Are y'all hearing me? Some friends that you've been calling and talking to and suddenly you just, you know, you forgot they ain't called. You, <laughs> you, you ain't gonna hang out with them no more. And they ain't gonna hang out with you. I told you, I think I told you all with that a couple of years ago, four of my pastors left at once and took several of the saints with them. It just started cell groups and, and they all left. Some of them have been, one of them have been 20 years, 18 years, the guys that have been in my life and I love them and I still love them today. Went down the road, started a church. Started to go down in Bernadette, but the Lord told me now. <laughs> You know how it is in holiness. You, we, were, we were in such holiness. I was raised in it. I'm fourth generation, so we didn't even know how to cuss. I wanted to go take some cussing classes just to learn how to cuss somebody out. <laughs> I started to offer some cussing classes in my school of ministry. <laughs> and the Lord showed me. I, I started, I stopped eating, I started fasting and praying. The Lord showed me that the space shuttle, when, it, when, it, when the space shuttle takes off, it has these things called rocket boosters that help it get off the ground. When it gets a certain altitude, the rocket boosters fall off. And ain't nothing wrong with the rocket boosters. It's just that they're not designed to fly in the shuttle's orbit. There's some people going to put in your life as rocket boosters. They get you off the ground, you go so far, and they start falling off. The higher you get, some more fall off. Don't get mad at them, it ain't nothing wrong with them, but they're not designed to fly in your orbit. Where you're going, they can't go. They ain't supposed to go. They don't even want to go. Let them go. Look at somebody and say, let it go, let it go, let it go. It served its purpose. Don't get mad about it. They're not designed for your orbit. Look at someone and say, I am, I am climbing, climbing. Jacob's ladder, and everyone goes higher, higher. I'm moving on up a little higher. How many ready to go a little higher? How far somebody say, I'm going on up that ladder. I'm climbing on up to where God would have me to go. My God, I see something nobody sees. I'm going somewhere nobody else is going. I hear what God is saying in my life, and no weapon formed against me will prosper. Glory, glory. Tell somebody, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. Come on, say it again, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. I'm on my way to a wealthy place. You may not go with me, but I'm going anyway. Let me stop. I buried a 15-year-old this last week who was playing basketball, run down the court, and up he went for a slam dunk, and his heart just stopped. He hit the floor, did, man. I've been in my church since he was three. A little Catholic school. Well, I was the most prominent Catholic school in our city. And so I had to eulogize him, and they came by the thousands. And I mean, our church was packed with all these Catholic kids and Catholic priests. And 
And I said, I know you all are wondering why God would take that little boy at 15 years old. He was so sharp, handsome, smart, had hundreds of trophies, just had a very promising career. His mother was almost unconsolable. I went to the house and she just was laying back. She would bring me his trophies and his um, medals and ask me to, uh, just so I could be proud of him and tell him, congratulate him. And I always publicly announce that to encourage other kids because you hear all the bad things they do. So when somebody gets an A or a, B, a good grade or wins some, I, sh I, I have the cameras pointing and I put his face up on the screen. But this woman was coming too much. <laughs> she, was, she was so proud of that boy. She was, he really was winning hundreds of things. She was very into him. And when I got there, she kept saying, I want to go. I want to go. It should have been me. I said, you know why I wasn't you, sweetheart? You aren't finished. You ain't ready for heaven. I said, you can cry, but you can't die. Not now. You can grieve, but you can't leave. You still have a little daughter and a husband. When I talked to all those kids, I said to them, I know you're wondering why this little boy died your colleague, your young friend. I said, the question is not why did he die? The question is, why are you still alive? Between our realities and God's absolutes, there's an obscure place where people get trapped or entrapped. All of those people who died seemingly at the Trade Center, if you really add it all up, Mother Rucker, there could have been 73,000 people killed that day. Amen. If the 50 or 60,000 who would normally be in the Trade Center had have been there, Amen. and the 23,000 that would normally be in the Pentagon had have been there, and if all those planes which could have seated two or 300 apiece had had, nobody had, not one of those planes had more than 80 people, and some of them only had like 40 or 30 people. Amen. And so far, they've only been able to, to, to find 3,000 people that are unaccounted for. So out of the 73,000 people who would have been dead that day, 70,000 of them have an incredible testimony Amen. of why they didn't die that day. I went to Ground Zero, my wife and I, we, we flew in there and they take us, took us right down. We, could, we saw the broken glass, we saw the soot on the, on the statues and, the, and hundreds of stores with broken glass and the mannequins there with soot and ashes all over them and rolls of shoes and shoe stores with ash all over them and, and everybody was walking like in slow motion. You could smell the stench, Dad, of decaying flesh because rats and birds got to some of the bodies before the emergency rescue workers did. But 70,000 people at, the, at, the, at, the, at the, the Pentagon, could have been 23,000 that day, 123, I think, got killed. So all these people have a testimony like this. For some reason, that morning, my alarm clock didn't go off. I got up and for the first time since I had this car, I couldn't find my keys. My little boy had a cold that morning, so I couldn't leave. I got too late, to, and I missed the bus. I got to the airport, and I didn't have my ID. I had to go back. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? I couldn't find my license. My alarm clock went off. Somebody stole my car. I missed the bus. All kinds of excuses. And you want to know why you're not dead? You ain't finished. Look at someone and say, I'm not finished. I got more to do with my life. I got another song to sing. I got another teaching to give. I got another prayer to pray. I got somebody to live for, something to do in my life. I ain't accidentally show up here. God left this man on this planet. Look at someone and say, I'm anointed to be sitting here tonight. I'm empowered to sit next to you. Say, there's so much anointing on me. If you knew where the Lord brought me from and how much God had done for me, you'd probably shout for me today. Tell him, if you knew how much God had invested in me, 
you probably pay me to let you sit next to me. I got anointing on me. God is all over my life. God is all over my soul. God kept me here. No weapon, say it. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Yeah, yeah. Come on, clap your hands, clap your hands, clap your hands. Clap your hands, all ye people, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. I'm going to nudge somebody and say, I'm on a mission here. I'm on an assignment here. God's ordering my steps. My steps are ordered by the Lord. Where he leads me, I will follow. And I can run through a troop and leap over some walls and demons tremble when I wake up in the morning. Hey! Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Say it, assignment, assignment, assignment. I'm on an assignment. I'm chasing after a vision. God has showed me something. Stand on your feet all over this building. Levantense. Stand up for just a moment. There is so much destiny and so much power and so much anointing in here. I know many of you Longtime members at Evangelistic Center have heard dad's stories. Many of you haven't. You don't know what he's been through. The days he pushed the plate away and fasted. The times he was betrayed or hurt or looked over and pushed aside. Kiss one of the babies and have to give another one a whipping. Change somebody's diaper. Lay hands on another one. This is PhD here. Who man ha who has no formal education? He has many vocational and natural skills. He's millionaire quality. And if you, t if you tally it all up, he's literally raised millions of dollars over the years for the kingdom of God. It ain't in his pocket, but that doesn't mean he didn't generate it with churches and reports and offerings and tithing, just the tithing and feeding babies. This is greatness embodied here. God's leaving you here for? You know, you know how many funerals he's been to? Including one of his daughters? How many of his old running, running buddies are gone? How many bishops and superintendents and district missionaries and church mothers and state supervisors? How many chairmen of elders boards and chairman of finance committees and YBWW presidents and Sunday school field workers and how many midnight calls come, mother's dying, so-and-so was found dead, rushed to the hospital, come down to the jail, go talk to the family, stop the alcoholic husband from beating one of your members, meet the mother at the at ICU whose half the son's head is blown off or I mean, he doesn't tell you all that stuff. Sometimes he had to counsel and comfort somebody in a very unhappy situation when he was wondering how he was going to feed his kids. Coming out to the church, rain, sleet of snow. Get on his knees and pray while the saints gather. Then get up and teach. Then raise the offering, then have the altar call and try to cast a few devils out. <laughs> Lay hands on the sick, anoint them with oil, push the plate away. He never thought a thing of it. All 
all the seed, that tall and all these, that elegant woman there, first lady, all these. Only God. Only God. Peach preachers, kids, they think we're privileged, but we go through something others don't understand. Now, she's singing under the anointing, but she could be bitter and angry and rebellious and have gone to the world. She didn't have to stay with holiness and stay with the Lord. She might have run up on Mama crying one night. All these preachers' wives have loaned their husbands to the entire world. I saw them come to church with brushes and combs and a tambourine and a Bible. Braiding some one of them girls' hair. A little, what them little bags that the ladies care when babies are born with, uh, with diaper bags with bottles and stuff. A tambourine. I saw Mother Peterson cut and combing hair and quickening it. <laughs> you know them mamas with some of them had a switch or a bell. Some of them slap you side the head and speak in tongues. <laughs> I saw them testifying. A, row, a whole row of 15 kids. I want to thank and praise the Lord for being here tonight. I thank the Lord for my life. I thank the Lord. <laughs> Pop him upside there and say, hey, thank you, Jesus. Wonderful Savior. Thank God for my life. I'm going to beat you when we get home, Junior. Hey, thank you. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Give you a little slap upside the head and then prophesy a full-fledged hog killing when you get home. <laughs> Folks, mistreat you, and because of holiness, you won't tell them off. You won't talk back to them. A lot of our, our, our people die of cancer. Many of the spouses, they have internalized and pushed down so much pain and hurt and anger. Turning the other cheek. Don't want to upset the house. And that's gnawing and eating. It's one thing to give it to the Lord, another thing to give it to your liver. You thought you gave it to the Lord, but it went to the liver, and it ate the liver away, and they're dead today. Y'all, you hear what I'm saying? Most of our pain is historical. It comes out of our past. It hurts. Sometimes somebody told you when you were a little kid that your nose was flat or, or that you were slow or you were fast or you were shy. You have to be careful what you say to your babies. You can't say, but just, he's just a little shy. He's, he, he, you know, he's to himself. He, he's, because you plant that in his or her mind. I was the fourth child of seven that were born to my mother and six who are alive. So... By the time they got to me, wasn't nobody rejoicing. <laughs> Sometimes the middle children are the more achievers. They're more sort of because they're trying to prove something. When the first one was born, everybody was rejoicing. Boy or girl. Pictures galore. Second one was born, in my family it was a boy, so they had excited about my brother. Then my sister came. By the time they, I came, somebody threw me over in the corner, put me a hand-me-down pacifier in my mouth and said, make it on your own, boy. They, ain't got, they don't even have no baby pictures of me, brother. They ain't got none. Two little baby pictures, little teeny ones, and I, don't, and I ain't got no clothes on. <laughs> I'm a little, little teeny thing on the bed over there. Sometimes the middle child, or even the last child, is struggling to find affirmation, validation. Somebody tell me it's all right for me to be here. Especially if they didn't expect me. Your mama's little mistake, your daddy's little mistake. They, they, they do internalize that and they start believing they're a little mistake. My, my wife heard her, her daddy say he loved her for the first time that she could recall the week he died. He was an alcoholic. He was very physically and verbally violent and abusive to his mother. She had been abused, not by him, but as a child. So when you marry somebody, you marry everything they've been through. And we have
have so much baggage on us. One time I said to my wife, I said, baby, look, 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 I am not your father. This is God. This is and she said, and I am not your mama. <laughs> argument with your wife and, and you know you're supposed to pray when you get through you just turn over <laughs> with your back to it and, my, and, and she always go you, well you want to pray and I'm thinking no I don't want to pray <laughs> I don't even want to play I'm mad <laughs> come on y'all know what I'm talking about well you want to start it I'm thinking you don't want to pray I don't think God gonna hear me tonight. <laughs> One time we was, we was trying to cast the devil out of each other. <laughs> Can you believe this? We had just got married and, and uh, you know how it is, the husband and wife go, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Satan, the Lord rebuke you. <laughs> I command you to come out in Jesus' name. I command you to come out in Jesus' name. You foul, tormenting, evil spirit. <laughs> Dad, I was so mad. I thought, no, she didn't. I know she ain't casting the devil out the bishop. <laughs> I was so mad, I got up and Mother Rook and went upstairs. I got in one of them other rooms. And my girl came on up the stairs, casting the devil out. I said, I'm trying to pray. Just leave me alone. <laughs> she had the cutest little outfit on, little pretty little Negligee. pink outfit on. Oh. I kept looking, I thought, that devil ain't that bad. I'm going on back <laughs> I'm going on back downstairs. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't that bad. <laughs> And he stayed in both of us. Ain't that beautiful? <laughs> Wrap your arms around yourself. <laughs> Marriage is not just the coming together of two lives. It can be the collision of two histories. Marriage and ministry and family. And you administrate. You're an employer. You're a community activist. You're a humanitarian. I want to restore to you lost visions now as I pray. God's going to give it back to you. The Bible says he restoreth my soul. Some of you left part of your soul in that last failed project. You put your soul in it and you left part of it there. You left it in a failed relationship and a shattered dream. So you're standing here fragmented. One of your children took part of your soul. The person you used to work for who worked for you. A Sunday school teacher might have taken a little bit of it. You can't hardly stand because some of your soul is scattered up here in yon with all your experience. So get it back tonight in the name of Jesus. He restoreth my soul for his name's sake. No more fragmentation, no more partial being. In the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost come upon you right now, the deliverance of God. Speak. Loose, woman. The Lord deliver you now and set you free. Cast the devil out of your mind. In Jesus' name, broken hearts, broken homes, nervous tension and stress, what they're calling post-traumatic stress. Addicted to adrenaline, addicted to hyped up fears. Loose! Satan, the Lord rebuke you. I command you to leave that house, leave that home, leave that head, leave that hand in Jesus' name. Here comes that wayward son. Here comes that daughter. They're coming back. They're coming back. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, give them the vision back. Open up those eyes. Unstop the deaf ears. Loose the stammering tongue. Bring peace of mind. My soul delights in you. My soul is glad in Jesus. 
I give you praise. Hallelujah. Come on, get those hands up in his presence. Receive the blessing of the Lord and make it rich and add of no sorrow. Every home, every heart, the business, the body. God is doing it. God is doing it. God is doing it. God is doing it. God is restoring somebody right now. Every ulcer, every tumor, every growth. Sleeplessness, anxiety, stress, duress, anger. I come against it in the name of the Lord. Loose and let go. Pity, self-pity. You who are complaining that you're childless, you're unproductive, you're giving God excuses. You're being healed right now. Cancer, the Lord rebuke you. High blood pressure, heart disease, sugar diabetes, migraine headaches, ulcerated stomachs. Loose hell! Hey, loose! Kidney infection, bladder infection. Go away by the power of God. I command you to be whole in Jesus' name. Yay, 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 yay! Mental illness, oppression, depression, go away from here. Get out of that house. Financial crisis, spirit of debt, spirit of poverty. I break you, I bind you, I cast you out and off. Now! Hey, hey, in the name of Jesus. Come on, shake yourself and get free. Shake yourself. Come on, choir, shake yourself. Let it go, let it go, in the name of Jesus. Let it go, let it go. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Let it go. In Jesus' name, you're not going to die. It's not time now. I command disease to get back. Get away. Get out. Let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Come on. Let the breath of the Lord. Catherine Cohen would say, and I believe in miracles. And I'll tell you exactly why I believe in these miracles. It's because I believe in God. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And that mighty third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And that sweet anointing of the Holy Ghost is in this room right now. Come on. Yay. The glory of the Lord is falling upon us right now. We're not here just for the fun of it. God is manifesting his supernatural power to change conditions in your life. Be healed. Be healed. Restored right now with the Spirit of God. Mighty anointing of the Spirit of God. Mighty anointing of the Word. Just sing it one time through before I let you go. Come on. And all Somebody's being healed right now. And all Wonderful Jesus. Spirit and by your power and by your power. Fill this room with your mighty anointing. Supernatural miracles. Morning of thy presence has come to hell. Hand of the great one, touch you and deliver. Spirit of the living God. And I believe in miracles. I believe in the supernatural presence. Come on, and Jesus is the Lord singing, and Jesus is the Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Jesus is the Lord. Heaven and earth and under the earth, and Jesus.
somebody and say your life will never be the same now look at me one time I preached a sermon to have all stressed up and no place to go look at me I want to rid this room entirely of a spirit of worry I want to rid this room in your life of anxieties cares upon him all your anxieties for he careth for you I don't care what the doctor said what the lawyer said but the landlord said in the name of Jesus the name that's above every name sickness must bow financial debt crisis must bow every generational curse I break it right now in the name of Jesus the curse on your children on your marriage on your family on your household Loose in Jesus' name, be healed. Fear, fear. I rebuke a spirit of fear. I come against the spirit of fear. Torment and punishment. Go in Jesus' name. Somebody's being delivered right now. Oh, all stress related illnesses, anxieties, sleeplessness, insomniac spirits tossing and turning be healed behold peace that passes all understanding and the understanding that bringeth about peace in the name of Jesus come on God's doing a supernatural thing in here tonight I see him performing surgery hey yeah he's removing something from you now you've carried it since you were seven years old and God is delivering you right now hallelujah My wife doesn't even have those nightmares anymore. She used to have these nightmares when we first got married. But every other night, at least once a week, I'd wake her up or she'd wake up crying. And she was always a little girl running from somebody. I'd make her tell me right there, baby, what is it? talk to me right now. What is it? Oh, I, was, I was running. This man was chasing. And that went for like six months. And I realized about a year into the marriage, there was something out of her past that was trying to haunt her present that wanted to ignore the fact that I was her new covering. Because I was never in those dreams. She was always a little girl when she was abused. And I remember that I said, how dare you, Satan, come into my house, into my bedroom, and crawl up in my bed and torment my wife laying beside me. I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. I command you to take your hands. Lose her! took the authority back from out of her past that thing that had held her all those years do you know I don't even remember the last time she had one of those dreams and they were so repetitious they were ruining men let's take charge in Jesus name and if you don't have a man he'll be a husband to the husbandless and a father to the fatherless all you with nightmares and fears and loneliness and rejections and betrayals I come against that spirit in Jesus' name. And the last thing I want to say is don't expect it to happen business as usual. It ain't going to happen that way. He is about to blow your natural mind, I'm telling you. Oh, my, 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 my. Look at somebody and say, not this time. God's going to do a new thing. 
So if you are, if you're wasting your emotions being disappointed because it didn't happen the way you thought it was, welcome the new day. God's gonna do it His way. Oh, I feel a shot. My, my, my. Come on, how many of you want a crazy miracle? I mean a miracle that don't make no sense at all. I mean something that's almost stupid. I want you to give God 30 seconds of crazy praise. I mean lose your natural mind. Just give God the praise. Listen to this. A few years ago, the Lord told me, I'm not going, I want you to begin to praise me, not for what you've worked for, not even for what you've wanted for. I want you to praise me for what you've been waiting for.
somebody, say, excuse me for getting happy, but you don't know what I've been waiting for. You don't know how long I've been waiting for. It. And God's about to give me what I'm waiting for. Take that devil. Say, take that devil. Come on, what you gonna do in my shout, devil? What you gonna do in my praise, devil? What you gonna do with that, devil? Glory! You know what, and realistically, turn to somebody and say, I'm, sta I'm in a room full of millionaires. <laughs> millionaires, <laughs> prosperous, blessed. Tell somebody, say, I'm blessed, I'm rich, and by faith, I am dead free. Troubles goodbye. In fact, wave last week goodbye. Wave last month goodbye. Wave last year, last decade, last. You can wave a whole millennium goodbye. You stepped into a new day. You just stepped outside the tent, and God's gonna show you something you didn't know was there. Let me tell you how simple this is gonna be. Not one star that Abraham counted that night was new. They had been there every night for centuries. But God made him notice them. There's stuff around you you haven't noticed. Opportunities, connections, contacts, doors. God's going to point some stuff out to you that you didn't even know. What the? It's going to be easy. It ain't going to be hard. It's not going to be difficult. It's not going to be... Those stars are fixed. This is a fixed fight. There are things that have been in place since the day your mother got pregnant with you. And your name is on that star. Your name is on that miracle. And listen, folks have talked you out of it before. But I'm telling you, this thing is so sovereign. Nobody is going to be able to talk you out of it or walk you. You're going to get it this time. Tell somebody, say, I'm going to get it this time. I'm going to get mine. What's mine is coming to me. You can have yours, but I'm going to get mine. 
anointing and the fertility of the ground that's here prepare your heart for a sacrifice toward the ministry that you have just received the millionaires to come raise them up start speaking it into your own congregation tell them say it put it before them the first one that came out in our church was 28 years old that's how young he was another one was 26 still millionaires today they're, old, they're older now. But when God spoke to me, I started preaching prosperity in my house and prophesying. I, I'm going to start something now in Jesus' name. Don't just let the ministry be blessed. As you, every time you plant a seed in the fertility of the soil, something's coming back to you. Next Sunday, when, when you pray your tithe, as you give offerings, you don't give tithe. You you, you can't give something that doesn't belong to you. Return tithe. You haven't started giving until you tithe. You return the tithe. That's called a sacrament. You give an offering. That's called a sacrifice. Tithing is not a sacrifice. Tithing is a sacrament. Tithing opens the windows of heaven. Giving offerings is when the blessings come out. Huh? Start that and something happens supernaturally happens all through this whole crowd not only does it happen financially health comes into your bodies your marriages your relationships accidents and incidents stop happening with your kids God just clears stuff out because you you step into another ranking are you hearing me are you hearing me are you hearing me bless the men and women of God and we watch what God does for you have I talked enough? So you, you, you ain't going to do that, but go get a sandwich when I get through anyway, because it's Friday night and we're all hungry. We done shout it, and we're going to get some more calories on us. I want you to give not as a debt you owe, but as a seed you sow. Some of you are going to give $50 tonight. It's 40 product. And um, I don't know what it is about that Azusa stage. It just, um, it, it ain't us. It's just some, there's a certain anointing on it. Ronzo Pretlow pastors the largest church in the denomination that, that, that William Seymour founded. 85 members. It's only 435 members in the whole denomination. It was 80, but it's grown quite a bit now. Nobody had ever heard of him. But he wrote that song and sang under such anointing. God has blessed us everywhere. G. Martin, who people thought was dead, he said he, the phone's ringing off the hook. And he's anointed. He's been coming all these years and I didn't even know it. I was talking to T.D. Jakes last week. God has done something so tremendous. Miles Monroe, just last week, Miles said, because of Azusa, my message of purpose went all over the world. It was on live television. Glory to God. It's our day. That's why these things are happening. And um, I saw new effectual doors of opportunity. Uh, you, you've just scratched the surface. Let me tell you, this life we live in, in especially in the recording industry, is very frustrating. It's when you have gifts and talents. It's just so many record companies. It's just crazy things happen. But you, you're about to hit a certain vein. You've already hit it in the anointing. You've hit it in the spirit. Now you're going to hit it in the natural. The same, as easy it is for you to, to roll your voice and sing and cut. Doors are not, you're not going to have to touch them. It's like going, you know how you go to the grocery store and when you step on that pad, the door just come open. That's what's fixing to happen to you. You watch. That's what's fixing to happen to you. I'm talking about Patty LaBelle and Aretha Franklin listening to your stuff. Hey! It's going to bring them back in. 
it's going to bring them back in. They're going to listen to your stuff, and it's going to bring them back in. We are we just scratching the surface of the revival that's coming. You don't know the hurt, the rejection, the betrayal, how folks steal from you, lie on you, take your money, and, and, and cheat, and that stuff's fixing to stop for you. I'm telling you now, girl. It's over, it's over, it's over, it's over, it's over! It just began. How it's gonna be over and just begin at the same time. We'll do what he said. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hey girl. Thank you. Wow, can you believe it? Thank you so much for watching this special presentation from our Look Back series. Although we travel back in time, we pray that this service encouraged you as the good news of Jesus Christ is always timeless. Our vision is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and ultimately make a difference so that we and you can live a better life. And if you would like to partner with us by giving, you can text ECIM with your given amount to 7797 or visit our website, ecinternational.org. Also, be sure to like and subscribe. Check out all of our other content. Our services begin every Sunday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now, you go out and live a better life.